equivalent of the Europa League, like the mm-hmm. second second top sort of competition in Europe. Uh, we got beat in the final by Toulon. Yeah, yeah. It's interesting. Rugby is actually a really decent spectator sport sometimes, but it's it's very badly it's badly marketed because there's no reason why it earns sort of less so much less money, let's say than, than football. Um, because yes, there probably is a gap because obviously football is more popular. Um, but at the same time, um, it shouldn't be like a lot of clubs are impoverished in in, in the pro leagues, aren't they? Like they go to the wall quite regularly. Um, and you think, yeah, that's just bad management, though. That's that's I mean, there's a lot less rugby fans than football fans, it's as simple as that. But you can make fans, though. I mean, you, you can make oh, yeah. fans by creating a product. Uh, and the example there is the Indian um cricket, uh, what was it uh, Super Tens or whatever it was, Super whatever? Yeah, yeah. Um, that's the Indian Super League, sorry. That's been yeah. that, like huge. They just created the, the the restructure of it, and then suddenly it's the top top league. So something yeah. like uh, for that for, for rugby could definitely happen. Anyway, folks, go just on. one quick thing: rugby's rugby's biggest problem is the the all the scientific stuff coming out about head injuries. Yeah, it's quite it's quite clearly mm. um, a dangerous sport. Dude, I, I've I I actually am a victim of it. Um, I've I've suffered two concussions playing rugby, and I do believe it's affected my memory in a, in a significant way. Um, and even now, I can actually feel like slowly degrading. I can't even speak properly sometimes. I wonder whether that's mm. got something to do with, you know, some long-term fucking traumatic injury or whatever. Um, but anyway, let's get on with the show. Welcome, everybody, to Brain Food Live on Air, bringing it to you every Friday, no fail. It's episode 220, a nice round number for us. Um, and today we've got an, an, another amazing conversation. Bit of a depressing one, really, because we're going to be talking about how to get money when no one's giving us any money. How do you make a business case for recruitment tech um, when uh, sort of in 2023, where basically no one's got any budget? Um, so, folks, if you're watching this actually on Crowdcast straight away, but one of the things I want you to do is actually hover to the right hand side of your screen. You should see kind of a poll uh, icon there. Go ahead and vote on the poll and just let me know where you stand currently on on sort of uh, budgeting. Be good to know what a gauge, it's just a little bit of a gauge of what the audience is feeling right now kind of predict that budget is very tight but let's establish that in terms of uh, a democratic vote shall we um anyway let's get on with it um i just want to check our sound checks by the way so crowdcast if you are voting you probably can uh sort of see evidence of that um but if you uh can hear me on crowdcast please do let me know in the chat um uh, we should be broadcasting this live in multiple places um again on linkedin adam gordon's linkedin is powering out as usual so if you're watching this on Adam Gordon's LinkedIn, do let him know that you can hear and see us okay. Just going to check on my phone whether I can see myself there. This is basically how I do uh, uh, do my own checks. Yes, we're live on LinkedIn. That's all good. Um, and I think people can hear me okay. So yeah, thumbs up from a lot of people that loud and clear. That's all well and good. Okay, fantastic. Um, let's get on with the show. Oh, first thing we've got to do is thank our sponsors, of course. So uh, thank you to our awesome sponsor. It is again, Candidate. Um, they've been a sponsor for Brain Food Live multiple times this year. And again, they're stepping up to do so once again. Um, uh, folks, without our sponsors, we couldn't run this show every week. So uh, give huge thanks to our sponsors. And in fact, I do believe Alex Van Claveren is on and available uh, to come on and, and have a quick chat with us. So let's see whether we can bring on uh, Alex um, and we'll see what chat he's got to give. Um, let's have a look. One way he's still going to do his... Uh, do his uh his uh his offer which i'm sure was like overloaded last time um like free sourcing support i mean uh seems to me like you should totally take advantage of that but um, i'm not sure whether that's still on um if, if so if not no worries but uh, let's uh let's see from alex and what he says there he is alex van clara alex a bit a, it's still summer mate there's no need for a, a hoodie uh, I mean, what's going oh on this here? is branded hoodie this is the branded hoodie so it was the only taking branded- the hint finally <laughs> it's the only the only brand you've got is the winter hoodie so i guess you've got high hopes for q3 q4 it's gonna be that's when candy is gonna come strong um fantastic Absolutely. good to see you both yeah great to see you alex and thanks for jumping on i know you've got a time limitation so we'll go straight to it alex why don't you uh, uh quickly introduce yourself who you are as you do and what is candidate and who should care about it 
Sure. Uh, so thank you, Hung. Thank you, Adam. Uh, it's great to be sponsoring this again. I'm kind of running out of scripts, so you have to bear with me. Um, so I'm Alex, CEO and co-founder at Candidate. The boxer, Mike Tyson, once said, everyone has a plan until you get punched in the face. And for many of us working in recruitment and talent teams in the last 12 months, it's really felt like we've been punched in the face. It's been a tough time for many. In the next few weeks, the early signs are that things are starting to pick up slowly, but they are starting to pick up. And we will be all kicking off new roles in Q3 and Q4. At Candidate, we build world-class teams. We partner with talent teams. We offer sources and talent partners who come and help you on short and flexible contracts. We hire junior to senior, from engineering to commercial in the US, UK, and Europe. And we save most companies 50% on their hiring costs. I will put my email in the chat. Please come and chat to me if you have one role or 50, or if you'd like to take us up on the sourcing trial. And many have, and it's been really successful. Or if you just want to come and chat about your hiring plans. Hung, Adam, thank you so much. I promise never to use a boxing analogy again. After what you said, talking about rugby, I was like, ah, oh, I can't change the script now. But thank you again for having me on. No worries. Uh, Alex, uh, Adam and I are boxing fans, so we very much welcome um, citation <laughs> of being smashed in the face um, and, and therefore plans go out a window. So more than welcome to hear about that. Um, and quite right, Usyk versus Dubois. What an amazing opportunity for Daniel Dubois. Um, he has, it's a, it's a big ask. Um, but you know what? Usyk is, is getting on. Um, you know what I mean? I think boxers can go at any time. So if he's lost a step, I think Daniel Dubois has got, got a shot. But he's, he's a rank outsider for this. Um, let's see how he does. I've got another boxing analogy if you want. And I think it was Marvin Hagler who said, if you're sleeping in silk sheets, you're not getting up for a 5 a.m. run in the rain. Yeah. And, and that's actually evidence uh, of someone who's like basically has achieved the luxury or the success, enjoys the reward of the success and therefore loses the hunger uh, or loses the edge to uh, when it really matters. I think that's relevant to entrepreneurship as well, to be honest with you. Um, it's, it's very relevant to that. But like Anthony Joshua used to used to sleep in a like a dormitory when he was doing his training in Sheffield. And I just wonder, and he was very proud of that, like with no mod cons at all. And I just wonder if he started sleeping in the Radisson or something instead. Yeah, I'm, I, I sleep in the Radisson and you know what? I'm a useless <laughs> Andy Ruiz. So, so, so all the evidence, that's one data point. That's and, all the evidence. And the, Andy Ruiz would smash you as well yeah, as a result. 100 percent um all right well listen alex wonderful let me quickly remind the offer you're still um anybody who wants to basically apply for it get in touch with alex and, and basically you have a chance at getting free sourcing support where basically you might get 20 additional candidates in your pipeline why not take advantage of it it's completely free to try um go ahead and get it um no reason why not don't be complaining to me that you don't have resourcing support here it is for free um, Alex, okay, listen, I've got to let you go. I'll see you soon, mate. Big soon. Cheers, Adam. Cheers. Cool. Um, we've got Angela Cripps in the uh, the chat there. Who's banging on about who's Daniel Dubois' number one fan fan club? There it looks like. Um, uh, but uh, but yeah, listen, I, all all the best for Daniel. I hope he I hope he does it. But Usyk is a slick customer. All right, let's get on with the. Uh... <laughs> Mick Thompson's just said, by the way, the difference between Usyk and Dubois. So Dubois doing his like um, media workout yesterday and he was in like doing proper, like hitting the pads, like smashing the pads and you six on there dancing, like proper fucking disco dancing. I think Listen, he had some like EDM on. I'm, he probably does. Uh, he's it's a very, uh, obviously I'm a big fan of you six as well. I think he's a really brilliant boxer, but um, could go anytime. Let's see. Let's see. All right. Let's get on with it, Adam. Let's review the newsletter. Did you read it? What was interesting? Give us a couple. Uh, yes. Uh, let's talk about uh, economics first. Um, the Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report was very interesting. Um, for the first year since 2008, global wealth has declined, um, which is quite interesting. It's declined more so in like the traditionally wealthier areas like North America and Europe than it has anywhere else. 
And there's also been a what they describe as a reduction in wealth inequalities. So the global top 1%, their percentage of overall wealth has fallen to 44.5%. Now, I can, I can appreciate that technically there is still a, a, a decline in the inequality there. But I mean, the top 1% still owns 44.5% of the global wealth. Um, shows what kind of world we're in. It, indeed it does. By the way, this is an economic report, but uh, it used to be Credit Suisse before they got uh, took over by UBS, but UBS now produce it under their brand. It's a global wealth report. Um, it's essentially trying to track what billion, you know, how many billionaires there are in the world, but also track sort of um, where, you know, the, the average mean is in terms of, you know, where we're doing it, in terms of our, our own sense of well-being. Reason why we've declined, by the way, it's very clear, it's declining in, in North America and in Europe is cost of living, interest rate rises. Basically, it's been bleeding us out um, over the last 18 months or so in terms of our wealth. Uh, that's why there's been that decline. But anyway, worth a look. I particularly like the idea of, you know, from a recruiting perspective, you could think about which areas of the world might be starting to boom a little bit. Uh, perhaps that's going to lead to more consumption or more investment or whatnot. Uh, could be interesting for recruitment business owners or anybody trying to launch product um, or getting investment or whatnot. And I think the sectoral stuff as well. So, so it's one of those where if you're able to take a strategic view on things and have a think about where you want to do some positioning, either for yourself or, your, or for your business, if indeed those two things can be thought of separately these days, then that is the sort of report you need to be having a look at. Um, okay, share the link in the chat stream there. Uh, go check it out. Give us another, just, Adam. Just, just on that, if I was a recruit, if I was setting up a recruitment business, I think there's only one place I would go today, and that would be India. And I would put all my money into it. Like I wouldn't put anything on red or black, everything into India, because that is such a big gun growing country and it's absolute chaos in terms of like who's who. So that's part of the reason why I wouldn't do it. Um, because I, I'm intimidated by India in the sense that I think everything kind of looks familiar, but it won't be. There'll be so many, so many local nuances as to how things are done that I don't think it's going to help an outsider coming in. I think the local Indians will have a significant advantage to any interloper coming from the outside. Uh, but anyway, um, I, I think interesting for sure. And Absolutely. recruitment works very differently there as well. Um, it's always been oh, I know. Yeah. a very sort of aberrant, and I mean aberrant with a small A without any moral judgment, but it's always been one of those countries that had an oversupply of candidates um, and, and their main issue has never been sourcing. It's always been about assessment. Um, and can you kind of assess quality of candidate, et cetera, et cetera. So, well, it's also about people um, turning up, Tur yep. like getting, getting offered the job and then actually not turning up on the day they're meant to start. Yep, uh, loads of that. Uh, we did a really early survey on this. I think 2017, India was very clearly uh, as, as separated from everyone else. Every other country said, can't find candidates. India said, you know what, we can't actually trust kind of information. Um, so uh, we'll, we'll see that we'll see that again uh, when I finally complete the What Do Recruiters uh, Want survey in 2023. I'll be a big push on this after this bank holiday. Okay, give us one more, a couple more actually. Um, yeah, LinkedIn, link from LinkedIn Insights. Uh, yep. I think that article was headed something like, do you want to be a talent leader or something like that? Mm. And it's given a bit of a breakdown of like the backgrounds of people who are TA leaders or L&D leaders. Mm -hmm. And um, some interesting aspects of it were like more females who are leaders than males. I think it was 65% of TA leaders and 59%, something like that, of L&D leaders are women. Of the TA leaders, it said 68% of them came from HR jobs. But then when you look at the other categories in there, you think actually probably most of them came from recruitment because the other categories in there didn't, in the recruitment was not a, an area. So that it must include recruitment. I think most TA leaders I know started life in a recruitment agency business. So it might, it's, got, it's got to be that. Anyway, the one that really stood out for me was that 64% of them were hired externally. So if you want to be a TA leader, um, you probably want to be moving company. Yeah, it, it's actually the, the, the most significant finding that I thought as well. Um, like why, and that surprised me actually, because I, I obviously know a lot of people who've been promoted, but it seems like 
yeah, a little bit excessive. I don't know what the benchmark is, but it seems that, okay, you want to achieve leadership, then step into uh, the external role. By the way, I had a lot of problems with, with this post. I wanted to share it because I thought actually it just touched on our industry, of course, and it was from LinkedIn with, you know, apparently 600,000 data points. Uh, but yeah, there were issues with how it was categorized. I, nonsensical for me to say that actually vast majority of people started recruitment from a different function. No, most people started recruitment in recruitment um, as a recruitment agencies. We know that. Um, and uh, and yeah, this was, they probably confused HR and TA a little bit. Um, yeah. And they also, there was some categorical issues with it. But anyway, worth a look, um, particularly on the, you know, how do you get promoted or how do you get that leadership job? And also very interesting on the gender divide. There are only 35 um, percent um, of the TA, what they call TA leaders, which again was a little bit of a fuzzy label. What does that mean? Um, were men, and sixty-five percent were women, and that's that's big. I, I would have thought much closer um, to the fifty-fifty mark, but it seems to be uh, pretty much female-dominated um, uh, at the leadership tier. Is that even true? I don't even know. So let me know in comments. What do you think? Are there more TA leaders that are women than the men? And is it does it chime with you? That it's a, a 65-35% uh, split in favor of, uh, of, of, of ladies. Uh, interested to know what your anecdotal experience is on that. Let me know in the comments. Uh, okay, give us one moment. Um, okay, so McKinsey's like state of AI um, report, that was uh, very interesting. Uh, it describes 2023 as the kind of breakout year for uh, generative AI. The bit that I wanted to touch on, because most of it is stuff we've covered before, but the generative AI-related risks that companies are working on and, and working to mitigate. So inaccuracy, um, cybersecurity, IP infringement. That was the top three. And then down in seventh place was something like workforce displacement. Now, I'm not sure why the organization considers that to be either a risk or something they need to mitigate against. I thought that most organizations were trying to accelerate that as much as possible rather than consider it a risk and mitigate against it. Um, given the amount of people I know in, in talent acquisition who are telling me that uh, they're getting a lot of pressure to take their team of 40 and turn it into a team of 32, you know, and not just in TA, but across every, you know, area of uh, business administration. Yeah. So that was the bit that I found really interesting in that was, was the areas that companies find to be risks and what they're uh, working on to, to mitigate against those risks. Yeah, it, it, it again, McKinsey do pump these out, you know, once every week, it seems, um, but they're worth a glance simply yeah. to just understand the sentiment of a McKinsey customer, um, uh, because that's typically a market leading type business. You know, if you're going to afford to bring McKinsey uh, sort of consultants in, you're going to be doing OK in terms of where you're at in, with your market position. Um, and those tend to be companies that can drag other organizations in a certain direction. So, you know, from that kind of way of looking at it, it's worth uh, worth having a review. Uh, okay, cool. Uh, let's get on with the show, mate. Um, building business case for um, for a budget. Um, I mean, this is going to be interesting. You've been a, a sort of a, 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 a recruiter. You've been a, a service provider. You've also been a recruitment tech person. Um, so obviously Evan's got an interest in doing this. I personally have never done it as an internal person to try and build a big a budget, uh, sort of a business case for a, for a significant uh, purchase. So I'd be really interested to know what the techniques are, of, uh, of doing that might be. Um, let's bring on our guests. I don't, uh, well, have you got anything to say, Adam? Go ahead and say um, it. Yeah, I mean, I, not, not, neither have I really, but what I have built, I have, I have built calculators and things, um, to help people that wanted to buy my technology products in the past and um you know a lot of that can comes down to how much time how much time can be spent as a use of as a result of using this particular product or service or whatever it might be and therefore what does that turn into in terms of money um i know that 
here's Nick is going to probably tell us that we want to connect it directly to revenue as well. So yeah, looking forward to uh, looking forward to finding out what our guests think. We will see. We will see. So okay, we've got both our guests on. Fantastic to see uh, Nick Thompson and Ariel Kilroy as well. Uh, okay, why well, don't do some quick intros? Uh, Nick, can you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Uh, hi, I'm Nick Thompson. I lead talent marketing for IBM. Um, and Hung, thank you very much for sharing my LinkedIn profile. So there's even more over there. Um, and also an absolute geek in our space. Yeah, fantastic. And you recently delivered a really very highly rated talk on exactly this topic, didn't you, Nick? Um, on on RefFest, which is what I wanted. I missed it. So hence, I'm kind of getting you in on this just to uh, backfill what you I just want a personal topic. recap, don't you, <laughs> like, don't you? Oh, I get it. I get it. That's right. Um, and we've got Ariel Kilroy as well. Ariel, great to see you. Um, can you quickly introduce yourself? Who are you? What it is you do? Yeah, absolutely. So I am the CEO of a startup called Dato, datohr.com. We are an employee experience automation platform. And because this is a new category of software, I help prospects create business cases to get budget um, internally all the time. Additionally, I used to procure a lot of software uh, pre this time. So I have a lot of experience building business cases for six and seven figure uh, projects. Fantastic. And I mean, Errol's actually got a, a fantastic business case builder, which we can explore a little bit later. Another reason why Errol is on the show here today. Um, okay, let's talk about this issue, building the business case. Um, who really does that? I mean, I guess there's multiple tiers of it, isn't there? I mean, if you're an operating uh, individual con contributor, presumably you'd be building a business case to your departmental head. Um, if you're a departmental head, you'd be building the business case uh, even further up, right? So uh, let's deal with the, the first one first. Um, you're an individual operator. I mean, Nick, you're a person that manages a team. So are you, Ariel? Do you get people coming to you with business cases? And you say, no, that's not happening. Of course not. And then have you thought about why you made that decision? Um, Nick, let's go with you on that first. Yeah. And the first thing I would say, Hung, is you're right. There's kind of two levels. It's the same. The, you should be effectively when I'm helping my boss understand why I want to invest it, I'm also educating them on how do they sell it to their boss. So there isn't a two-stage process. There's a, a two-person review board of it, but they're often the ones that are parroting what you tell them. So I, whenever I create a business case or I create a proposal, I'm doing this for a CHRO, I'm doing this for a finance team. I'm helping the people in the middle understand it. So don't look at it as we go that far, they go the next step. It's the same experience almost. All right, really, really important point. Understand the person you're pitching to, unless they are the CEO that actually has the, all the money. If, unless you have that direct relationship, there's a chain of command and you've got to equip the person ahead of you to make the case. And I would guess part of the reason why people would say no to you is because you've not done, you've not done that. Like you've given, you've given your boss nothing to, to go with. So they're not going to go with it. Um, don't make that person look stupid. That's the worst thing you can do for a career is to make your boss look stupid or put your boss in a situation where they're going to go into an, a no scenario. Um, they want to convert as well. They want to get a yes so give them the opportunity to get a yes. Uh, Errol, you're nodding your head uh, at what Nick was saying there. Have you got anything to add to the observation that you need to equip the boss to have a, a further conversation up the, up the chain? Yeah, absolutely. So we often refer to these as champions, right? So you need that champion who can, um, who actually has the ability to control purse strings. Um, and that is usually the person who runs your department. Uh, if it's not, though, like sometimes you might be working with the CFO or someone in engineering and it's a co-led, um, but you definitely need to, if you can't find an internal champion to um, bring this, I'll say, to the point where you're able to evaluate budget, then you're likely not going to be successful in building that case. <laughs> So, so would it be fair to say you need to identify that champion then? Like that's one of the first bullet points on the list to, to figure out how decisions are made. So it's, it's not just blindly build a business case and pitch it to somebody. You've got to figure out how that, how, what the relationship is, the power network, 
uh, and how that you know who 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 basically contributes to a decision. So understanding that uh, how, how it works in business is a key point. Um, Hung, the one thing I will say from the breakfast talk and a load of other conversations, as TA, we need to stop asking for budget and we need to stop asking for money. This is an investment. Like this is not money and budget. This is investments. And in 2023, and I'm sorry, but probably 2024 and a little bit longer, we're going to have to make trade-offs and we're going to have to say we're going to spend X to get Y. I would say 90% of people I speak to who are like, how do you get budget? They don't know what they're going to get from spending that money. They can tell you it's shiny, it's cool, it's everyone else has got it. Mm -hmm. But they can't tell you what it means, recruiter efficiencies, reduction in job board spend, faster experience, whatever it is. It's just the Joneses are doing it and we need to keep up with them. I mean, this is Dragon's Den or Shark Tank. This is not, can I have more pocket money, please? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I do think that there's a little bit of a difference between spending that happens in other departments. You know, if you are in engineering, there is a, there, you might often see other departments say, buying the cool thing that's like the new thing, but they have a business reason usually to do that, which is we need to stay technologically advanced. So they, even though it might appear that other departments are get to have like the fun new thing, they're usually doing it because they're trying to actually drive some sort of business impact. You just might not be privy to seeing what's behind the scenes. So you have to do what Nick says. You have to really understand what's the impact that you're trying to drive for the business. Why this thing? Why now? The, I want to deal with the language issue because um, I, I may have got you wrong on this, Nick, but did, when you were saying don't talk about um, budget, uh, did you mean that uh, sort of as a literal sense as well as the conceptual level or was it purely uh, uh, conceptual? Um, so, like you... Yeah, so I would say uh, I spoke to five people at Wreckfest who all said to me they couldn't get budget for what they were trying to do. So I asked them to like, just role play. I'm your boss. How'd you come to me? And the first thing they all said was, please, can I have X amount of money, dollars, something to buy this? And I just went, it's a no. Don't even know why. <laughs> it's just a no. Like you've just gone in with that. Now go in with, you know, we've got this problem. I'll give an example of one we went through. Our job board spend globally is too large and data is awful to track. So you know that problem. So there's this option that means I can go with this vendor, and I'm not going to name them because I know we're sponsored in many different ways, but we can go with this vendor which centralizes all of our data. It makes our job boards less post and prey, more cost effective and performance related. And in turn, when we pilot it this year, we will see efficiencies in next year's spend. To do so this year, I need X amount of money to get there. The X amount of money is the Actually, that's a solution to my problem. That's a reasonable amount of money. And you've already told me I'm going to save double that for next year. So this sounds like an OK investment. Can I have X amount of pounds or dollars? No, is always the answer. So just flip it. And if you look at the Dragon's Den and Shark Tank, they tell you what their idea is. They tell you what problem it solves. And then they tell you what equity or how much money they want for it at the end. They don't start with it for a reason. Right. So basically, there is a structure to have the conversation, isn't there? Um, and uh, I guess expanding on the problem or describing the problem in such a way, the current state, um, I guess underlining that, making the pain feel obvious, um, and then suggesting here's a solution, but the solution is going to cost this. Um, however... The, out, the, 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 the end output of us spending this will be reduction of that. So there is almost like a clear pattern, almost a story arc as to how you have that conversation to acquire budget. Number one, problem definition. Number two, uh, maybe expansion of the problem and then what it might look like if you solved it. Number three, you deliver a solution that solves that problem. Number four, here's, the, here's, here's how much it will cost. Uh, but then number five, here's how much the saving will be if we spend it now. Something like that, right? Yeah. There's probably a sales methodology that says say. that approach. But it's the same thing. That's what we are doing. We are selling 
a problem and a solution, and that needs a bit of funding to get there. It sounds like a classic. Is someone, there's someone familiar with this who's listening to this. Does it sound like a sales like framework, some an acronym um, that you've been trained to do? If so, what is that sort of an, an acronym? Uh, let me know. Um, maybe it's the Ada thing. Was it attention, yeah. uh, interest? Uh, was it PSAC? Yeah. Decision a, you know, my background's in product, and this is what we do in product as well, right? Because you have to say, like, what are we trying to solve here? And if you can't get people a, aligned around what the problem is, then, then you don't have enough understanding of the problem. I wonder whether a technique as well, Ariel, and this is related to product as well, you can almost interview the person to set, help that, have them describe the problem uh, or restate the problem so it comes out of their mouths to understand, yes, this is an issue. And then you can come in with some sort of solution there. Yeah, so in sales, um, disco, right? Where you're doing discovery and you're trying to find what, what how does the pain manifest for this person? Mm -hmm. uh, the pain will manifest um, for everybody a little bit different. You know, if you're talking about, say, a job board, is there going to be, are you not getting high enough quality candidates and therefore you're wasting your hiring manager's time? So like, what is the pain and where do you feel it everywhere? Um, and uh, so you can have the problem and how it manifests. Yeah, that's a really good way of thinking. Adam, you just contributed something to the English language here. Uh, what, what is this you just typed in? It looks horrible, that. man. That's, not, problem. that's never going to work. Problem. Identify, like, <clears throat> talk, get, get, to the, get to what the problem is. Show some empathy with that problem. Amplify the problem so it makes them feel like the earth is about to cave in. Summarize. Provide some advice which is we need to invest in this area. And then the question would be, when can we start? Um, <laughs> I learned PSAC from a guy called Stephen Long, who I hadn't heard from for like 10 years or more, 15 years. And then he popped up on Facebook. I think he's popped up on Recruiting Brain Food recently as well. So um, that's uh, something which is a sales technique, which absolutely applies to this uh, for internally influencing people as well. Yeah, internal influencing. Uh, it's not about making the demand immediately because that's just an insistence, right? So, so the obvious answer, if you're a boss, is to say no to demands. In fact, as you kind of move up in your career, you, you actually become really good at saying no. Um, therefore, you've been trained as the, that that's your default. Um, so mm -hmm. come, busting out of it isn't going to work. Um, but having some sort of a way to set the scene and get them thinking about the problem set, I think makes sense. We've got other anachron acronyms coming up here. Acronyms, should I say? Uh, acronyms, even. Um, situation, problem, implication, need, and payoff. I guess that's a spin uh, uh, from Angela there. I like that also. Um, and some other people kind of talking about, yes, definitely share John Blastelica um uh, uh uh posts they're always really good to uh to listen to okay fantastic stuff um how do we know sorry i mean to say something yeah i was gonna ask do, do do we think is it important to be able to say like to be upfront about what the trade-off's gonna be so we're spending far too much money on these job boards but if we take the same amount of money and do this with it instead we're gonna get an uplift in whatever it might be or a reduction in whatever it might be um, is it important to do that? Because that way you're not asking for money. You're just reallocating resources. Does that help? I was going to say, this is the biggest piece. And I know home, this is how to get budget in 23 when there isn't any. There is. As we should always be reevaluating and resetting and checking what we're doing, how much of our spend across everyone on this call is habitual spending? Yeah. Is we had it last year, we're going to keep doing it. Yeah. yeah. This is a, you're about to hit that point in the year. Mm -hmm. Just stop. Don't repeat what we did this time last year. Because everything you folks spoke about at the start of the call says the economy is not what it is. The world is not what it is. If you're still spending in the same place as you were pre-COVID, have a word with yourself and put yourself on the naughty step. You need to reevaluate that now. Mm -hmm. And honestly... Our space is moving so rapidly that it's laziness or complacency that means you're going to just keep doing what you're doing. You have to reevaluate it. And some of this tech is not that expensive. Yeah. I mean, I also have to say there's a little empire building that happens in there too sometimes. 
Yeah. I, I yep. tell you what, really important observation there, um, because budgets probably already are being cut anyway. So if you're kind of sitting on legacy spend, as in regular spend you spend anyway, habitual spend in your speak, uh, uh, your wonderful phrase, Nick, um, the chances are someone's going to examine that. That isn't you. Um, that That is putting you in a vulnerable position because that spend that was inefficient might just be taken away anyway. So it's up to you as a leader to think, you know what, how can I actually reallocate this, get something new in, um, taken away from the habitual stuff, and actually means that the overall, if you like, amount of spend that you, you've you got access to hasn't been reduced. It's just been reallocated to, to new stuff. So an opportunity to refresh the technical stack, if you like, using the same uh, sort of amount of money, I, I, I suppose. Um, so, so very, very interesting. By the way, Mary Kay mentioned something really interesting as well on the chat. Thank you, Mary Kay. Getting agreement on problems. So one of the, that's one of the questions, right? Uh, Mr. Manager, do you agree, or Mrs. Manager, do you agree that we are spending too much on recruitment agency? Um, yes, or no. How, how much, how much do you agree with that? Let's not ask yes and no answers here, right? Good question. Where would you like to see that number? Uh, something to that effect. Um, <laughs> do you know what I mean? Everyone's going to say, I want to reduce. Then you say, okay, here's how you reduce it. You have to invest some of what we're spending today in this thing, and that's going to help us reduce it over time um, and, and in a permanent way. So that seems to me like a very doable kind of mental uh, exercise to think about whenever you're looking at um, uh, the budget. Um, how much do you need to know about calculating the costs? Because we're talking, uh, some things are obvious, right? As, uh, we're spending on X, we want to divert it to spend on Y. But other things like recruitment inefficiency or, you know, time to hire, like, do we need to put a cash number to some of this Candidate in order for us to... Yeah, exactly. I mean, pretty soon you might end up having a massive spreadsheet, let's say, of Board all of these inputs. Yeah, and it'll be like, oh, man, this seems like too much work. But do we need to actually do that? Would it be useful or is it realistic even to try? Uh, any thoughts on putting, a, I guess, a cash number on what may, may not be directly obvious costs in the current way of working in order to build a business a case for the next phase? I mean, thoughts I, on that, Ariel? Yeah, I think you have to do this because the reality is, is you, if you're solving a problem, one of the problems is, say, for instance, organizational efficiency or workforce efficiency, then you need to say what the before and after looks like. And that is going to be determined by costs. Um, in, time is money. <laughs> we know this, right? And um, and this is where most of your overhead as a business goes into is salaries anyway. So if what you're saying is that we can't afford to hire five more people, um, but we can save each one of our people in our, say, engineering department five hours a week, um, which basically gives us two or three extra headcount, then that's a pretty big impact um, and it will compensate for the, the investment that it takes to get there. Let's take that a little bit further. Um, and this is going to be a slightly taboo question, I think. So um, Ariel, <laughs> let me you... just let me just hover over the mute button here. Uh, let me just make sure I'm, I'm ready to go. Ariel, you, you used the phrase workforce efficiency and the example you just gave, we could take that a little bit further, which is I'm a manager and I want to be able to achieve this. And I know that if I buy that service or product, I'll be able to do it. And that service or product is going to cost me $100,000. And actually, it's going to mean that I don't need those four people who cost me $160,000 between them. Hmm. Right? I mean, this sounds pretty unethical. Like, and like hum as a human being, I feel really bad about saying this. Do you? How do we, how do we think about this subject? I really, I, I would really push back on that because otherwise we'll all still be taking our like big TVs to the TV repair person, like down the street, you know, like I, the reality is, is like the business, if the business doesn't stay competitive, then everybody on your team will lose their job. <laughs> so that's it, actually, it's yeah. absolutely right, Ariel. It's like, it sucks. I'm not going to lie. It sucks. It's the worst part of it. But there is also an element of, if we don't make that informed decision, that informed investment, finance, who know nobody, will do that. And they just look at the list and go, this cost, this cost, this cost. They go, and you end up with your entire business being run by your interns because they are the cheapest. Mm -hmm. And yep. there are points that it, it doesn't work. But also, there's a piece there about 
Adam, you went to the extremes of they have to leave the business. What if we can take that over to do additional work, which also reduces spend? You often hear we use agencies because we don't have specialists in that area. Well, why don't we make these people our specialists in that area? So it's a, the two-year, three-year model on this. Mm -hmm. Year one, save a load of money. Year two, save a little bit of money. Year three, we've saved even more money than year one. And investments are, again, hung so often. It's like, this is what we're going to get today. This is what we're going to get now. Businesses are businesses. And sometimes you have to spend a little to save a lot more over the coming years. And people need to look at those two, three year cycles and present a more rounded figure. But it doesn't always mean people need to leave the business, Adam. No, what Quite I would, a lot in 23 they do, but not always. Yeah. yeah, what I would really say is like, this is becomes an opportunity then to, um, you know, as, as you said, retrain or upskill these people, but also people want to have satisfying jobs. If you know you're doing a job that is a ticking time bomb to be replaced by a piece of technology, there's no way that's bringing you joy. It might pay your bills right now, which is of course important that like, let's not disqualify that, but you're really denying someone the opportunity to be even more employable later by um, investing in them <laughs> compared to yeah. just keeping them down. No, I think so. So I think Adam, you made a very, very valid point. Like what is the ethical consideration but at the same time, Good maintaining, enough. maintaining, no, maintaining uh, an inflated team um, that's running inefficiently is is a short term play, and that's not going to last a long time in yeah. in this market. That's going to come down on you because the the CEO, or the the CFO is going to make that change. And guess what? If the CEO and the CFO don't make that change, the entire business might go under with, with this type of approach. Um, so someone has to make that decision. You as a leader, it's up to you to do that for the department. Um, and as Nick mentioned, it could well be a case where, you know, where you, you, you do create an efficiency on, on, on element A, you might be able to repurpose people to address another measurement that's really important um, that isn't being addressed. And you can say those people might need to focus on that. So, for instance, let's say you care about candidate experience. Candidate experience is through the floor. Okay, great. We're going we're gonna to improve our ability to acquire uh, sort of candidates at this level with technology. But some of our people who are currently doing that job, maybe we re refocus them to do more sort of human-to-human -human work uh, with the candidates and increase the RMPS score or something in that area. And I think that's an argument you could, you could also strongly make uh, to, uh, to to the people that hold the purse strings. Uh, okay, let's keep cracking through. But before we do that, we have to just take a mini break because we always do this in the middle of every show, folks. Um, it's very important that Brain Food Live is a conversation starting show. It is not designed ever to be a bottleneck to stop people having a conversation when we come off air. And of course, we do need to come off air in about 15 minutes or so. Uh, so it is very important for us uh, if you do care about uh, this conversation about how to kind of make the business case for investment, for efficiency, uh, now is the time to share your LinkedIn URL with everyone else who's in this conversation and then make sure you connect with everyone else you see. So grab your LinkedIn URL, share it in the chat stream if you're in Crowdcast. If you're watching this on Adam Gordon's LinkedIn or on anybody else's LinkedIn, including mine, share it there also uh, and make sure you add uh, everyone who you see in comments. Um, quite simply, if we get 50 people uh, posting their LinkedIn's uh, in the chat or the comment thread, you'll walk away with 50 more connections, which is going to help you in some undefined way down the road. You know, you just can't predict when that is the case, uh, but it will do. Everyone here is interested in brain food. Everyone here is interested in topic. Go ahead, connect with them, uh, and I continue the conversation when we come off air. Okay, can you, cool. Can you connect with anybody new? I'm sorry? Can you connect with anybody new? Uh, I, I could, but I need to delete people to do that. Um, yeah, I thought so. <laughs> it's yeah, reallocating it, resources, isn't it? Yeah, but that's what it's we're very about it's very it's very painful to do to do the deleting on LinkedIn. It's it's there's no filter you can use, or there's no eth there's no ethical filter you can use. You can you can filter on name, um, and you can filter on like location and stuff. Um, so I ended up making what I felt were quite racist decisions. Um, and also quite like ran like all the Collins need to go, you know, just search for Collins and boom, you know, just pick a random name. Like how else are you meant to filter people? It's impossible. Um, so what LinkedIn need to do is actually create, you know, the last logged in type of filter. 
Um, because there's a bunch of people that are yes. not on LinkedIn anymore, yes. or the, it's been deactivated, yeah. or maybe you retired. Can. Ready? So, sorry, you yeah. can download your LinkedIn contacts into a spreadsheet and then filter them like that. I know, I'm never, never going to do it. Um, <laughs> yeah, no, yeah, but the the, the, the thing is, it, so I, I think Hans right. If there was a last logged in, that would be excellent because it meant that nobody, you know, anybody that logged in, you know, more than a year ago, just delete them. They're not, they're not going to be coming back. They're never going <clears> to <throat> tell you no one's logging into the platform, though, are they? <laughs> like, they're never going to tell you that easily or publicly. But yes, it would be amazing. It would be great, wouldn't it? Just to clean it up a little bit. Like I said, put it this way, it would be even better if LinkedIn just got rid of what is, in my opinion, fairly arbitrary number. Like, why is it 30,000? You know, why is it, yeah, it 100,000? It's totally arbitrary. Um, so, um, so yeah. Uh, oh, the, apparently there is a... Uh, uh, a, 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 an extension that shows you this, but all of these things are kind of gray area, and LinkedIn doesn't like it. And I'm I'm terrified at losing my LinkedIn account. It's very important for uh, what I'm doing, so I've got to keep it precious. Therefore, no downloads, Ariel. Um, okay, um, let's move on. Um, so we have philosophically how we're going to do it, mentally how we're going to approach it. We even have the language to describe it, and also the structure, the storyline, etc. How to do all of this? How do we actually put it together? Like, do we like? slap someone down with a deck straight away or do, is it like a one-to-one -one chat like how, how, what is the context and what is the medium for us to have what well, uh, the business case is it a multiple is, is it a series of stages like how does it even work nick do you want to say something uh yeah so the first thing is understand who it is that you're going to have to get a yes from and by that what i mean is are they a data a feelings or an experience type person like what are you doing? If everyone in your approvals chain is all about feelings, then hard numbers is going to alienate them and it's likely to drive a no. So again, understand who they are. What are you trying to get across to them? There will be a deck. For me, there is always a deck, but those conversations happen offline. And I don't know, I can't credit whoever it is I heard this from or got this from, but all meetings and all proposals should be a yes before you get into the room. So you go through each of those people and you get their buy-in, you get them understanding the problem, you get them behind it. When you get into the room, there's not many surprises. There's always some, but there's not many surprises because they've all said to you, yeah, actually, that's the right thing for us to do. So then you get into the room and you let peer pressure group thinking take your conversation where you often need it to go. So it is a game, but I'm not going to lie, it is a game, but you win more often than not knowing it's a game and understanding how to play the game as well. Yeah. So bit, go ahead, Errol. I would call that align your stakeholders. Um... Yeah, you can give it a fancy name. It's yeah. win before you get into the, the absolutely, room. But yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Like, this is a great thing. Work on your, and you can use the deck as like a way to drive that alignment. Dr figure out who you're going to need to have in that room. As you're working on your deck, do some review meetings with your different stakeholders, and you can um, really work out the questions they're going to ask. Make sure you're already speaking to it, that they already are responding to that. So by the time you get into the room, they've already seen everything you're presenting, and they're already yes, as Nick said. Yeah, so it's a lot of pre-sales, a lot of the stuff that you would do if you were... In fact, a lot of the, the, the practices in recruitment are similar, isn't it? It's like, firstly, building these relationships in advance. Like, nobody who's in that decision chain should be an alien to you in some way. Uh, like, if you don't know already right now, like, who actually makes the decisions in terms of, you know, uh, saying yes, no, or influencing uh, the, the budget or investment side, you, you kind of make some space in your diary to get to know them. Um, you, you need to have a, a plan around that. Don't, don't just assume you're doing your work in isolation and think, oh, when the time comes. No. You are a leader of your department. You need to uh, build those relationships in advance before you need them. Um, and then, of course, you can get a feeling of the uh, the problem set uh, and their attitude to it well in advance of that conversation uh, being had. Um, is it always a synchronous multi-person meeting, Ariel Kilroy? Nick's painted this sort of, I would say, a stereotypical position. I think it's pre-COVID pretty, pretty normal go in there, present the case, bunch of people around a table. Does this still happen like that these days? Does it have to be synchronous? Is it better if it's synchronous? Is it harder if it's asynchronous? It's definitely harder if it's asynchronous. There is, as Nick said, you know, this 
group think when you have a couple of different executives or leaders or from your organization there and one of them is like yes then the other ones are like okay i want to get on that bandwagon um and there's there's just power in the peer pressure of that room the only reason you would and i say room it could be a digital room you could have them all on zoom uh, uh, or google or whatever um the only reason you would not do that is because you have time zone issues in which case you would likely do too very interesting. So actually getting multi all the stakeholders together at the same time uh, when you're delivering the ask is what you want. And that, that makes sense on sales as well, doesn't it, folks? Like you're just getting all, let's say you're hiring for people, you want all the stakeholders together to have that decision rather than a contingent on different people. Then you're, then you're email chasing um, and, and, and that's a nightmare. Like you don't want to do that from a just operational efficiency point of view. No good, no, no go. Um, you're like chasing a lot of strands, you know, and um, it's just a lot more work. It's a lot more work. And there's a lot more risk involved in that because you have too many communication threads going at once. And everyone wants to know what someone else thinks. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I didn't know that. I needed so-and-so to tell me that. And it, what could turn into a 30-minute conversation, virtually, physically, whatever, it could turn into a 30 day, 30 month conversation really, really easily. Yeah. So it's have those conversations individually. I said, understand who someone is, are they data, feelings, etc. The way you talk to them is different. But when you do the, here's the wash up, here's the right, let's get the final tick, away we go. You've got a nod to everyone's wants and needs from this. They fully understand it. And you're, you're going through there. But it is just so much easier to get all decision makers in the room together as much as you can. And it's it so much of this is down to speed. And at some point, if this is going to take us two years to get this investment through of keep pushing it, is the return there? Because I, I hadn't built in spending two years to try and get 20 grand budget to get this approved. It suddenly is now not worth 20 grand anymore because I've spent 90 grand of my time trying to get it approved yeah so so actually it's the same rule as, as recruitment isn't it time kills the deal so if you have a business case you need to you need to define it almost in your own you have to have a project plan when is the yes no if it's like dragging on you've got to kill it yourself because it's going to bleed you out if you're spending time chasing this that and the other how many times are you actually pitching this idea do you need to go have another meeting about it all of those things kind of reduce the value of what you're trying to achieve because you might be spending all your time basically building decks and pitching people. Um, so you've got to get them all in the room, have a think about it uh, almost like uh, as a salesperson would do, like how many contact points per influencer, so to speak, do I require to get this done? And what is the number that I, I'm comfortable with? Because if this guy wants me to keep going back to him and pitching, <laughs> that's, that's not happening. <laughs> very, very good. Um, Okay, um, do we have any final bits of advice for people who are currently, uh, no, one thing I've missed, um, and this actually relates to your uh, business case builder area, actually. Um, what is the, 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 like the length of the deck? If there is a deck to be delivered, um, like is there an optimal size? Uh, like what, is, what do people like to consume? Um, is there any evidence as to what is good or bad on this? What, what, do, what are your thoughts? So you don't, unless you're, I mean, I don't think this is anybody on this call, but unless you're trying to pitch something that's a highly complex or highly technical solution uh, where people really need to start, you know, diving down into detailed requirements, generally speaking, you need to be able to deliver all of this in, I would say, 35 to 40 minutes so that you have time within an hour long meeting to be able to like have a robust conversation. That would be what I would, I would aim for the right level of detail based off of what you can communicate and engage people with in an hour-long meeting. Past that, you're going to just start losing people. And to follow on from that, break the problem down if it's too complex. If you're going in and proposing, we're going to change our ATS from X to Y, you won't land that in an hour. Yeah. You go in and say, actually, reviewing what we have, we don't think it's right, we need to go out. In an hour, you could potentially get an agreement that, yes, the ATS needs to be reviewed. Then there's a follow-on call. But if you've gone straight in of like, we're moving to this, this is what we want to do, 
you're giving too many reasons for people to get their back up and say no. Like they buy into yes, we need a new ATS, or we the benefit is here, etc. But break it into bite-sized chunks. Otherwise, as Ariel said, you could do 30 weeks on the full argument and everyone's just fatigued. And the answer is no, because they're too fatigued. Yeah. Yeah. What's the one thing that's the most important? Is it <clears throat> cost reduction? Is it sales generation? Is it better net promoter scores? Or what is there, it, Or is that not, a, not really a, a valid question? Well, I think it all depends on, so you go for it. I was going to say net promoter scores are something I don't believe in, but. <laughs> um, but enhancement I, in somebody's experience though, mm -hmm. like, a, like an enhancement in a hiring manager's experience or the candidate's experience or whatever. Is that like, where does that, is there a, is there a hierarchy in these metrics? So I would say this is almost universally going to be defined by what your business goals are, your OKRs, whatever you measure yeah. them in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And also your stakeholders. And I'm really sorry, but if I'm going to a numbers-led VP of TA, yeah. whose goal it is is to recruit, reduce spend in 2024 by X, and I'm going, can I have 100,000 to increase our NPS score? I'm not even going there. I'm just like, do you know what? No. Let me save you having to get rid of me for being so misaligned to TA's goal. I'm just not going to have that conversation. But if this is a, I need to invest $1,000, $2,000, and this will change this, which means this, which means this, that's a possible. But again, there's a clip point between can I have a million dollars for an NPS increase of five versus I could remove all of TA and go recruiterless recruiting for an investment of $100,000. Like, yeah. it is a big difference. Depends what you're pitching for, right? Yeah. I will say I'm going to drop a link in the chat to the direct Google slides. It's publicly available. Hun keeps referring to my business case builder. This is what he's referring to. <laughs> yeah, def definitely check it out. I mean, basically, it's one of those where you might not know where to start. I mean, to be honest yeah. with you, if you're doing this for the first time, we talked about promotions earlier, earlier in this chat. Someone's going to be promoted for the first time to a role where actually you may be making uh, appeals for budget in order to uh, uh, make investments of this type. That's the first time for everybody. Uh, you may not know where to get started. I do think that link that Ariel shared is definitely worth, it's a plug and play type of thing. Just put your numbers in there and it will generate you a deck that you can go and amend or even deploy straight away. So uh, why not make use of that? um and and get cracking okay that's about it folks thank you so much for um joining us nick thompson ariel kilroy what a wonderful pair you are uh wonderful to have you on the show and sharing your knowledge with us i'm sure everyone got tremendous value from that um hopefully we'll catch up soon we'll certainly bring you back if you offer another brain food live on air um and uh we'll uh, we'll see you both soon okay thank you so much nick thank you so much ariel yeah thanks, thanks. folks hey, everyone That was cool, wasn't it? I think it was, yeah. it was it was really interesting. Folks, by the way, we're finishing off the show. Let me just conclude. A bad, thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed it. Uh, make sure you follow the channel. We have a new link, by the way, to uh, the uh, Brain Food Live channel. Um, we're close to 3,000 followers on there. So if you are watching this now, follow the channel also, um, and you'll be notified whenever we go live. Um, next week, we are going to be talking again, focusing on TA leadership career tips for progression for TA leaders. So if you are a person that wants to be a TA leader or you're a TA leader that wants to step even further in your career, how do you do that? Uh, what is the techniques? What are the approach? What's the mindset? Uh, we've got, we've got uh, an Anais Newman who's going to come in, uh, Neumann even, who's going to present with, for us um, her wonderful uh, talk on performance and a profile. And we've got a bunch of people who've had success in their careers they're basically going to uh, sort of share us their insight and knowledge there as well. So make sure you register for that show uh, and we'll see you there next Friday. Um, cool. Anyway, pretty good, I thought. Hey, Adam. Yeah. So um, here's something here's something we're, we're doing in our in our new product. Always top right hand side. There is a value total 
which will say exactly how much the value of the assets and the product are. And there's also a, a time saved, cumulative, right? I had a joke with somebody the other day about we could take it to a next step, which is when that amount of time saved gets to a certain point, it then sends a message which says, ding, ding, 37.5 hours per week. You can get rid of hung now. <laughs> Get rid of hung in fucking one hour, mate. Um, but um, but yeah, a bit I, aggressive. I think we, we'll, I think we won't do that. Yeah, no, but I tell you what, that's actually a really good feature. I think to, to just get people thinking about revenue a little bit more and, and what time is, because time is important. Um, and and we need to you know optimize. I mean, everyone with this has been the year of do more with less, right? So um, so yeah, that's exciting, man. That's good to hear. Um, uh, uh, so where you're at. Um, and what's going on with it? Are you still sort of getting, it was still onboarding people or is it like they're very early for beta or what? Private beta starts on the 5th of September. 36 companies are uh, lined up to take part. That'll last till the 17th of October, at which point companies can start buying it. Um, oh. And yeah, very, very scared about 36 companies. It's far too many to have agreed to. I, I've told about 30 companies they can't do it yet because they didn't quite fit the right profile but yeah. 36 like when 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 i mean it was last night a well-known german automotive company filled in the form to say they want to take part head of talent in that business i'm not going to be saying no uh, yeah, you you've can, got to just get part. them on board yeah you've done a brilliant job marketing this by the way it's been really good um a, a uh, thank you. good example um thank you yeah anyway what's happening this weekend spat holiday weekend is it it's not for you is it uh, in Scotland, uh, is it? it it might have to be i've i've been uh i've actually been in hospital this week um really? yeah yeah i've been i've had a i've had a really really bad headache and they were a bit concerned that i might have bleed on my brain so oh, i went into uh went into hospital got a ct scan uh that didn't reveal anything so the next step was they did a um Oh, a, a lumbar puncture. <sighs> My God, that was not, not pleasant at all. What the um, heck that involve? I, that's a spinal tap. Oh getting fluid out of your spinal, out of your spine to check if there's any blood in it because the fluid in your spine is the same fluid that's in your brain. So okay, just checking in case there was any blood in that. Turns out it wasn't, but nobody's quite sure why I've got such like throbbing, throbbing headaches. And Still. uh well, I still got it, yeah, and I'm actually right now. I'm going to bed. Uh, for about I'm half sorry an hour. to hear that, man. I mean, listen, if you need to take take some time off, brain food, I, just no, I say. Felt, I, I felt mean... okay at the start. I felt okay at the start of the show. I'm gonna. Um, I'm. I'm actually gonna go for 20 minutes sleep right now. Uh, yeah. I was on a show yesterday, a TA Tech thing. I, I actually had to leave, um, which like in the middle of the webinar, which was um, pretty bad. I've never had to do that before, but I I, I felt okay at the start, and then. I could see myself just going whiter and whiter and whiter and feeling really bad. But um, it, it might be too, too much of the, 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 cause you're doing so much of the video, man. I mean, is it anything to do with like just staring in front of screens and that effort or what? I don't think so. No. Cause it's, it's um, the, the doctor, uh, the, the consultant, actually, he described it. At, he said what it probably is, is something exertion, uh, something exertion primary a primary exertion headache what the G, the gp was worried that it was a thunderclap headache and that would have been would have indicated potentially a bleed on the bl bleed on the brain but like it's good that it's not that but it's not good that people know what it is no uh, no no well listen take a, yeah yeah take it easy man whatever you're doing um I, i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna sleep and what yep. sport? The, the the World Athletics Championships. Love it. Absolutely love it. I was, I, I've actually just, wasn't aware it was on, but until I saw a few tweets on it. And yeah, I've, I've missed loads of it, but some of it's been amazing. The, the, oh, um, so great. The, the uh, Kerr guy, that's a tremendous beat in England, Britain, yeah. mate. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's Absolutely. a legend in that in that sport. So, um, so yeah, listen, I'll, I'll get off the call. I want, to, I want you to get some rest, okay? So um, uh, take care of yourself, mate. And we'll, yeah, we'll, enjoy your weekend. I'll see you soon. Yeah, I'll chat to you next week, okay? Cheers.